friend on the head with the misguided packet. He had been possessed of much fear of his friend, for he saw how easily questionings could make holes in his feelings. Lately, he had assured himself that the altered comrade would not tantalize him with a persistent curiosity, but he felt certain that during the first period of leisure, his friend would ask him to relate his adventures of the previous day. He now rejoiced in the possession of a small weapon with which he could prostrate his comrade at the first signs of a cross-examination. He was master. It would now be he who could laugh and shoot the shafts of derision. The friend had, in a weak hour, spoken with sobs of his own death. He had delivered a melancholy oration previous to his funeral and had doubtless, in the packet of letters, presented various keepsakes to relatives. But he had not died, and thus he had delivered himself into the hands of the youth. The latter felt immensely superior to his friend, but he inclined to condescension. He adopted toward him an air of patronizing good humor. His self-pride was now entirely restored. In the shade of its flourishing growth, he stood with braced and self-confident legs, and since nothing could now be discovered, he did not shrink from an encounter with the eyes of judges and allowed no thoughts of his own to keep him from an attitude of manfulness. He had performed his mistakes in the dark, so he was still a man. Yeah, that's pretty significant. You guys should write that down. How has Henry's attitude changed? Does he feel like he got away with it? And now he's feeling superior to his friend, who actually was in the battle and did fight. So just in a matter of 24 hours, he went from being afraid and hiding to back in the regiment, kind of showing off his war wound and puffing himself up a little bit. Indeed, when he remembered his fortunes of yesterday and looked at them from a distance, he Middle began to see 90. something fine there. He had license to be pompous and veteran-like. His panting agonies of the past he put out of his sight. In the present, he declared to himself that it was only the doomed and the damned who roared with sincerity at circumstance. Few, but they ever did it. A man with a full stomach and the respect of his fellows had no business to scold about anything that he might think to be wrong with the ways of the universe, or even with the ways of society. Let the unfortunates rail. The others may play marbles. He did not give a great deal of thought to these battles that lay directly before him. It was not essential that he should plan his ways in regard to them. He had been taught that many obligations of a life were easily avoided. The lessons of yesterday had been that retribution was a laggard and blind. With these facts before him, he did not deem it necessary that he should become feverish over the possibilities of the ensuing twenty-four hours. He could leave much to chance. Besides, a faith in himself had secretly blossomed. There was a little flower of confidence growing within him. He was now a man of experience. He had been out among the dragons, he said and he assured himself that they were not so hideous as he had imagined them. Also, they were inaccurate. They did not sting with precision. A stout heart often defied, and defying escaped. And furthermore, how could they kill him who was the chosen of gods and doomed to greatness? He remembered how some of the men had run from the battle. As he recalled their terror-struck faces, he felt a scorn for them. They had surely been more fleet and more wild than was absolutely necessary. They were weak mortals. As for himself, he had fled with discretion and dignity. He was aroused from this reverie by his friend, who, having hitched about nervously and blinked at the trees for a time, suddenly coughed in an introductory way and spoke. Fleming, what? The friend put his hand up to his mouth and coughed again. He fidgeted in his jacket. Uh, well, he gulped at last. I guess you might as well give me back them letters. Dark, prickling blood had flushed into his cheeks and brow. Oh, all right, Wilson, said the youth. 
He loosened two buttons of his coat, thrust in his hand, and brought forth the packet. As he extended it to his friend, the latter's face was turned from him. He had been slow in the act of producing the packet, because during it he had been trying to invent a remarkable comment on the affair. He could conjure up nothing of sufficient point. He was compelled to allow his friend to escape unmolested with his packet. And for this he took unto himself considerable credit. It was a generous thing. His friend at his side seemed suffering great shame. As he contemplated him, the youth felt his heart grow more strong and stout. He had never been compelled to blush in such a manner for his acts. He was an individual of extraordinary virtues. He reflected with condescending pity. Too bad, too bad. The poor devil makes him feel tough. Okay. So he reflects on when he saw that huge group of men rushing at him, and that they were screaming and asking questions, and he said that they they ran without discretion and they were weak, but when he he ran and hit, he did it with dignity. Is, well, I ran is with there a form of cowardice that has dignity? And then he, he felt that he was being generous for not giving his friend a hard time and giving him the letter. He's turning into a... So Henry's character's changing quite a bit. Okay, let's finish up this chapter, guys. After this incident, and as he reviewed the battle pictures he had seen, he felt yeah. quite competent to return home and make the hearts of the people glow with stories of war. He could see himself in a room of warm tints, telling tales to listeners. He could exhibit laurels. They were insignificant. Still, in a district where laurels were infrequent, they might shine. He saw his gaping audience picturing him as the central figure in blazing scenes, and he imagined the consternation and the ejaculations of his mother and the young lady at the seminary as they drank his recitals. Their vague feminine formula for beloved ones doing brave deeds on the field of battle without risk of life would be destroyed. Okay, let's stop there. Chapter 16. Yeah, notice the, uh, right, Mr. Ansbaugh? The almost like evolution of this kid who starts out thinking of himself as a hero, then goes to a coward, now beginning to rediscover some of that heroic tendencies. Um, one thing I want you to put in your notes, and I don't know if I've mentioned this yet, but uh, I'll, I'll say it now so you want it in your notes. Crane at 3A, this is a 3A observation. Crane, the author of our text, is working with a very famous story in the back of his mind. That story is mentioned early in this text. What is the greatest single literary text about war ever written? The most famous song of war ever written in the Western tradition is what text? Do you remember what it's called? The Iliad, outstanding, outstanding, Homer's Iliad. For those of you who saw Brad Pitt's film Troy, you know the story of the Iliad. For those of you who have ever seen Monty Python's Holy Grail, you know there are references to the story of the Iliad with the Trojan horse or the wooden badger. For those of you who uh, watched that film The Odyssey, uh, you know the story of the Iliad. The Iliad is the great story of war fought outside the walls of Troy, the greatest city of the ancient world, where men collided in major battles. Of course, the most famous fight in the Iliad is when Achilles, the great warrior of the Greeks, 
and Hector, the great warrior of the Trojans, meet outside the walls of Troy in a monumental battle where Achilles kills Hector. And ostensibly, that will lead to the end of the war with the Greeks winning and the Trojans losing. Of course, anybody who lives in Troy is called a Trojan, right? So, Crane is playing a game with us as readers. Assuming we know the great story of the Iliad, and he will play a different kind of game from a psychological perspective. The young kid wants to be Achilles, and unfortunately he ends up acting like something other than Achilles for much of the story, right? The other thing I want to point out to you is that this is a story that plays a similar game to what we do in jam writing. You'll want to write this in your notes as well. Constantly, the young man in this story is playing the game of internal dialogue, where he's talking to himself. Think about for a moment the way that jam writing Ms. Torres plays a similar game. So let's say, for example, you're out driving in the middle of the Badlands late at night, and all of a sudden you're alone, and all of a sudden your car breaks down, right? What's the first thing that you do? Well, Ms. Murray, we won't argue why you're in the Badlands in the middle of the night in your car alone, but it, let's just say that you are, and it breaks down. What's the first thing you do? You're all by yourself, Miss Vigil. First thing you do, right? You start, you start talking. You start, you start talking to yourself, right? So, oh, this is just great. Now I'm, oh, what am I gonna do? Now I'm in trouble. I know I'll call on my phone. My phone isn't working. Now I get out. I slam my door. Now I'm opening the hood as if I got any clue what I'm gonna do under the hood. And if I were to step out from behind a sagebrush and ask you. Who are you talking to? Yeah. You would, of course, yeah. jump out of whatever underwear you used to be wearing, right? Uh, but, but, after all of that was finished, you would have to say it out loud. Well, I didn't have anybody else around, so I was talking to myself. The truth of the matter is, if you watch young children playing, they play often alone with their Legos. But if you look at their, at their mouth, their lips are moving. They are talking to themselves. I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then They're talking to themselves. You were doing this from the age of two when you acquired language. And you constantly were talking to yourself. By the time you hit kindergarten, first grade, those teachers will tell you. They have to teach kids how to stop talking out loud because they're talking to themselves. So, for example, if you go into a kindergarten classroom and they're doing artwork, they're all sitting by themselves, but all of their mouths are moving. They're talking to themselves. If you've ever seen ball players do this, I know. A baseball player backs out of the batter's box as he's ready to hit. The camera will come in on his face. His lips are moving. Dude, he is not talking to anyone other than himself. We do this self-talk thing all the time. Freud said you're doing it right now. He said, you're doing it right now, inside of your head. You're actually, I wish you would shut up and we could get on to the next thing so I could get the break and then I could be done with this stupid thing and why did I have to take summer school anyway? Blah, blah. That's constantly going on in our head. What jam writing does is it takes all of those kinds of thoughts and just puts them on the page. Your self-talk becomes stuff that you just see on the page. And over time as a writer, you can actually discover you got all kinds of interesting thoughts happening at the same time. I want to point out, Crane is playing an interesting game with us where he shows us a lot of the self-talk of this kid. And in the process, makes us ask, what kind of self-talk would we have in a similar circumstance? Several times Ms. Laird asked that question, how would you respond if you were in a similar kind of circumstance? Fascinating. All right, we'll now move on uh, to our work before break. You need to open uh, your hymnals to page 681. And you need to have a blank sheet of paper out now for your uh, annotation work. Right away, you want to number down that left-hand side of the page. 1, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B. Uh, 6.81. By the way, I just happened to scan my eyes across the room, and I see that Mr. Drake has brought with him the volume of Harry Potter, and it makes me think of this. The novel you're working with now, Red Badge of Courage, is an extremely famous novel. Are you ready for, hello, hello? Extremely famous novel. People who you read today, writers, we think, for example, of the author of Harry Potter, know this novel, Red Badge of Courage, very well. 
And they sometimes will make references to it or draw on it or whatever, right? The story of a young boy who has to overcome his fears to become a hero, right? We're familiar with that storyline. It's a very ancient one. All right, here we go. We now will spend a little bit of time working. Again, all I'm trying to do with you here is to help you learn how to do this annotative process thing. I'm trying to show it to you over and over again. So you ought to have your hymnal open now to 681. We're going to be looking at the Rita Dove offering Grape Sherbert. I always have found this a remarkable little poem. I think sometimes, Mr. Amsbaugh, a poem like this is wasted in a freshman anthology. Freshmen, it seems to me, are often incapable of appreciating a poem of this strength. I'll try and point that out now. Let's first of all assume you've already logged in. Let's assume you've listed down the side, left-hand side of the page, 1, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B. Um, hello? Hello? One of the things that will tell you you're growing as a reader is when I start to make observations and you can immediately tell if I'm working at level 1, 2, or 3. And the notes then that you make down, in other words, you don't need me to tell you, hello, I'm about to make a level 2B observation. I don't need to say that anymore. You will already know. When he starts talking about the form of the poem, he's talking 2B. I'm going to jot down a note there. When he starts talking about what the poem means, he's talking 2A. I'm going to jot that down there. When he starts talking about how it relates to another text, I'll just jot that down at 3A. When you know that you're there, you've moved to the next level as a student of annotation. And guess what? Your reading starts to go up. Why does it matter if we read? Because if you're a junior or a senior, you have to take what's called the ACT to get ready to go to college. That is a three-hour reading test. I'm going to continue to argue you want to learn how to annotate your test booklet. Mr. Uh, uh, Staub, soon Mr. Dewar, the ones giving this test, will always say you can write in your book. That means you can annotate. By the way, let's point out, we won't be using these anthologies again. We're done with them. We've got new books that have already arrived which is a great gift to us because we can actually practice internal annotation. We can actually write in our book because these books are about to be sold or discarded anyway. So you've got red ink in your hand. We'll go ahead and look at this poem quickly, do a little bit of practice annotations. For those of you going on to college, guess what? You'll buy your books, Mr. Boltz, and the expectation is you'll write or annotate in them, right? All right, let's work together now. I'm on page 681. Focus, concentrate with me. Again, if I don't feel like you've done a, th a, th a thorough job with your annotations at the end of this presentation, I'll just ask you to stick around for five more minutes into the break to make sure that it all gets done. All right? Great Sherbert. The day memorial. After the grill, Dad appears with his masterpiece, swirled snow, gelled light. We cheer. The recipe's a secret, and he fights a smile, his cap turned up as the bib resembles a duck. That morning, we galloped through the grassed over mounds and named each stone for a lost milk tooth. Each dollop of sherbet later is a miracle, like salt on a melon that makes it sweeter. Everyone agrees. It's wonderful. It's just how we imagined lavender would taste. The diabetic grandmother stares from the porch a torch of pure refusal. We thought no one was lying there under our feet. We thought it was a joke. I've been trying to remember the taste, but it doesn't exist. Now I see why you bothered father. Now I'm going to point out right away, this is a far more complicated poem than at first glance appears. And I also want to argue that Rita Dove, the genius American poet Rita Dove, is doing something quite remarkable in this poem. And it all begins with the opening line. Notice, the day, question mark, memorial. And right away at level one, we're going to write down what does Memorial Day mean and what is it that happens on Memorial Day? What is it that happens on Memorial Day? Are you familiar? We just 
recognized Memorial Day. What is it that happens on Memorial Day? It's a special day dedicated to what? The fallen, isn't it? The fallen. More particularly, what do you do on Memorial Day? If you have individuals who, in your family who have fallen in wars, in battles, you memorialize them by going where? Where do you go to memorialize the dead? You go to a cemetery. Now that's crucial to understanding this poem. If you don't understand that, this poem is kind of lost on you. You go to the cemetery. What do you do at the cemetery on Memorial Day? Well, for those of you that have never done it, what do you do? You kind of go to the graveside. You put flowers there. You show respect. Right? The stories that are told in Red Badge of Courage draw pictures of what it means to be in battle where young men and, of course, women die. And then... They want to be remembered afterwards. So that's what Memorial Day is. Number two, this poem is a reflection back in time to when the poet speaker was a child, a little kid, who is trying to understand or come to terms with this strange day where two things happen. One, they have to go to a cemetery. But if you're a little tiny child, the obvious question is, are we at the park? This must be a strange park. Think of it. If you're a child, how do you understand a cemetery? An adult will say, no, 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 honey, this is no park. This is not a park. Well, what is it then? Well, it's called a cemetery. Well, what is that, child? What is that? Well, it's... And then all of a sudden, an adult, it hits you. Crap, i got to try to explain this to a little kid. Under the ground are dead bodies. <laughs> right? How else are you going to explain this to children? Under the ground are dead bodies. They used to be alive, just like us. Then they died, kind of like your goldfish did that one time. And then they're put under the ground. They're dead bodies where you're walking. Of course, how do children, how do children think about a cemetery? They do what? They run around and play, don't they? It's kind of a strange game. You maybe don't recall the first time you went to a cemetery if you were a child. It's a strange place. You probably saw it as kind of this surreal, it's always quiet. It's always well-groomed usually, right? Grass is really nice. It's like a nice grass. If you're a child, you see grass. What's your first inclination? You want to run, right? You want to run and play. And that's exactly what children will do. That's the first thing that happens on Memorial Day for this child in her recollection. The second has to do with her father's making of a very popular eatery, a little dessert, sherbet, only a special kind of sherbet, grape sherbet, which we're told he has a special recipe. Nobody knows exactly what's going on. So in this poem, you've got a child who's trying to figure out the bizarrity of on the one hand, you got to go stand next to these like pieces of rock stuck out of the ground. We call them cemeteries. But on the other hand, you get this great tasting sherbet o on the same day. So you got these two things happening. Well, of course, we understand Memorial Day is a day for us both to be sad and to reflect, but it's also a day to celebrate and be happy and therefore the sherbet. Finally, the poem will end with an observation about her father. Clearly, her father, this is a tribute poem to her dad, her father isn't alive anymore. And she's reflecting back to this amazing man who had this capacity to make this sherbet. She captures something, though, about children in the poem that is quite remarkable when we read this as adolescents. Let's take a look now at the poem. The Day Memorial. After the grill, why grill? What else do you do on Memorial Day? And some of us love this. What do we do on Memorial Day? Fire up the grill. You bet. You either put you put some kind of meat on a grill, and you know, it, for those of us that like that kind of thing, there's nothing that smells better in the early spring or the early summer than uh, you know than than uh, you know a grill that's giving us some kind of food stuffs. Right. Uh, take a look at it. After the grill, Dad appears with his masterpiece: swirled snow, gelled light. We cheer, obviously a reference here to the title of the, uh, of the poem, Grape Sherbert. 
The recipe is a secret and he fights a smile. Why does he fight a smile? What is it dad likes about the fact? Why does he fight a smile? I don't understand. The recipe is a secret. What's the first question everybody wants to ask about grape sherbet? How do you make it? How, do you, how did you get it to be grape colored? And he won't say. He likes the fact that he can kind of, you're not going to get the secret out of me kind of thing. Smiles. And then we, we learned something interesting about our dad. Some of you grew up with people like this. The, uh, you respected them, you feared them, but at other times, they could be really funny looking people who made fun of themselves. Notice we're told his cap turned up so the bib resembles a duck, right? He's got his hat turned up, right? Kind of rolled up maybe. In other words, her first memories from this poem of her dad are what? Jot him down. What does she, what does she seem to like about her father? He's a funny guy. What else? What, would, what else would you say, Mr. Drake? You, you need to be writing, Mr. Drake, or you're going to miss break because you'll uh, have to be sitting in here writing. What else would you say about him? He's, a, he's kind of, a, he's kind of a, an, an artist. An artist with ice? Sherbert? He's kind of an artist on the grill? He's a guy that likes to play the role of being the leader of the celebration. First stanza. Second stanza. Now, and again, see, the genius of this poem is it takes a while to figure out what in heaven's name is she talking about. Watch this. Now that I've told you a little bit, you'll go, oh, this poem is way cool. Take a look at it. That morning, earlier, before they ate the sherbet, we galloped through the grassed over mounds and named each stone for a lost milk tooth. What? Galloped over what mounds? Mounds? What mounds? Where were they earlier in the day? They were at a cemetery, right? Where the mounds, right, of the people buried. What do children do? Well, adults are very somber when they go to a graveyard. Children can't be somber. They don't even know what death is. For them, hurrah, it's a different kind of park. I'll chase you. You chase me. We'll run around. There's these strange rocks that resemble teeth. In what kind of special graveyard did they go where the, the, the gravestones st all appear to be the same? You got it. They obviously went to some place where lots and lots of veterans are buried. Possibly even they went to the greatest cemetery of all for military vets. Where is that? We're talking about where? Gettysburg comes to mind, but I was speaking of the greatest one. The one with the most important of our fallen. Yeah, you're talking about Arlington Cemetery. And if you've ever seen it, it's just miles of the exact same tombstone over and over and over again. Looking... For a kid, like the teeth in your mouth, right? Kind of got that strange shape to them over and over again. A milk tooth, if you will, right? They're kids. What do they know? Of course, she put it, now she joins it together in the second stanza. Each dollop of sherbet, dollop means drop. Later is a miracle like salt on a melon that makes it sweeter. Everyone agrees it's wonderful. It's just how we imagined lavender, the color of grape, would taste. Interesting, the diabetic grandmother stares from the porch, a torch of pure refusal. Ma, Grandma, Grandma, come down here. You've got to eat some of this or, uh, grape sherbet. She stands on the porch. I will not. I have no interest in your sherbet, right? Grandma, Grandma's diabetic. She can't eat, right? In the child's mind, what? She's dia what? What is that even? Why would anyone not want to eat this beautifully tasting stuff, right? Children can't. You can't eat it? You don't want to eat it? What is wrong with you, Grandma? This is the best tasting stuff in the whole wide worlds. Come on, come down. And the Grandma, not interested. See, a child is trying to put together. What a strange day. First they take us. Take a look. We thought... Last stanza. Brilliant, brilliantly crafted poem. We thought no one was lying there under our feet. We thought it was a joke. What? And again, if you don't understand what's going on here, and you don't, basically what's the key of the whole poem? It's in the first line. 
Memorial Day. If you don't understand that, this whole poem makes absolutely no sense. We thought, what was a joke? We thought, what was a joke? People the people are under the ground, dead. What are we here for? You can't run like that, honey. Stop, stop, stop. Why come? Because this isn't a park. This is called a cemetery. Really? What is a cemetery? Uh, it's uh, where they bury people. They're be dead people under the ground. You can imagine a child's mind is like, <laughs> what? They put people under the ground? You know, yeah, right. Adults will tell us anything to keep us from running. Yeah, right. There are dead people under the ground. See how that works? <laughs> of course, all of a sudden, the poem will end with a moment of reflection, and you realize that Rita Dove is remembering, or the speaker of the poem, is trying to remember something else about the dead. Ah, see, Hernandez goes, ah, I get it. Right? This is a poem of a tribute to a father, what? Who's already dead. He's buried. Right? And the minute she starts thinking about cemeteries, her mind reflects back to another day when she was young. Hurrah, we got grape sherbet. Oh yeah, there was that weird thing about you couldn't run around these special places. See how that works? Joining of two different moments together. Notice the brilliance of tense. Past, present, future. Did you see this? The poem will begin the day memorial after the grill dad appears. Did you notice this, Mr. McAfee? Present tense, appears. Not past tense, dad appeared. Present tense, dad appears. So she puts you, the reader, right in the moment of what it was like to be a child. Then to the past. Finally to the future as the poem ends. Notice... Um, I've been trying to remember the taste. The taste of what? See, our first inclinations are obviously, well, yeah, obviously, Dad made this amazing sherbet. I've been trying to remember the taste of sherbet. But what are some other meanings of the taste? The taste of what? What other tastes could she be talking about? Yeah, that taste of the past. Her father, goofy looking. All that kind of stuff, right? The taste, he's, um, she finishes by saying, but it doesn't exist. What does it doesn't exist mean? He's gone. He's gone, right? He's gone. She can't claim it anymore. With the passing of the old man, her father, the passing of the secret recipe for grape sherbet as well. She can't make it. Probably kept it somewhere. See? There it is, right? The question would be maybe for her, I wonder, hmm, I wonder. Of course, the observation is, even if I could make it, it might not taste the same because why? He made it. See, this is all part of it, right? This is a, what we call for your notes, tribute poem to her father. Anybody can say, I miss my dad. He's dead, I miss my dad. Anybody can say that. It takes a poet to put together two moments in time. Brilliant, isn't it? Brilliant poem. What's even more amazing is you didn't get it the first time you read it. You didn't even have a clue. In fact, when I finished reading this, unless you're a pretty astute reader of poetry, you didn't even understand this is a poem about dying. You thought it was a poem about great Sherbert because that's what the poet called the poem. Notice to finish, but it doesn't exist. Now, she says, I see why you bothered father. Bothered? I don't understand. What do you mean bothered? And what does she mean, now I see? What is it that she understands now she did not understand when she was young? Right. Now she understands what cemeteries are. Right? Now she understands what the value of a tombstone is. Now she understands what it means to make grape sherbet. Right? So all of these different moments all coming together in her memory as a remarkable tribute poem. This poem leads at 3B now, personal reflections. This poem leads to all kinds of interesting questions. Let's, let's jot down a couple that you can think about. Do you have one person in your life, one, that you already can identify, you're gonna remember later in life for something they did, something they thought funny, did funny, are you going to identify, can you already identify one person in your life who bothered, to use the language of the poem, who bothered? 
When you're young, you don't get it, right? But as you get older, you get it. Number two, questions, observations. You can just jot these down in 3D. Do you think it's possible that it really is true about people? You don't know what you got till they're gone. You know what I mean? You just kind of take them for granted. Of course dad made grape sherbet. What else is he going to do on that special day? It's only after the fact that it hits you. Oh yeah, it probably was a lot of work to do that. And all we did was eat it and run off to go play. Do you think it's true you don't really often appreciate the people in your life until they're gone? We don't necessarily even have to mean dead. We can mean just gone as in separated. In other words, when you leave and go away from home for the first time, you can have a tendency to all of a sudden, all the pieces start falling into the place. Oh, yeah. Right. Number three. What for you is your first memory of cemeteries and of death? For some of us, it was very early in our life because we had to go there because somebody we cared for passed. Or they drug us there for somebody we were supposed to care about that died and we didn't even maybe know them, you know. For some of us, cemeteries represent sad. For others of us, cemeteries represent victory, triumph, right? What is it for you? Do you remember when for the first time do you even remember when you went to a cemetery for the first time? See, for some of us, that's a memory that is so long ago, we can't even recall what that means, you know, for us. Finally, this poem raises a really interesting question. At some point in your life, you stop being the child who runs around the graveyard naming the tombstone's teeth, and you become the adult who then has to take care of the child at the cemetery running around. You become the adult who has to make the grape sherbet. We're obviously speaking in metaphor, aren't we? You become the adult who has to take care of somebody else. I remember a ball player of mine saying, you know, this whole thing happened to me just the other night in full color because I played volleyball my life and uh, I signed up to be one of the volleyball coaches for a bunch of seven-year-old girls. And I was at the community center last night and I am not kidding you. It's like literally hurting cats. I mean, there's just no way. You try and teach them something, they're seven. They're not listening. They're all talking. They're running in a thousand places. And then it occurred to me, I was one of those kids. And there was a coach I had, she said, I know I did, who was a kid, you know, a high school kid. We thought that she was a big grown-up person, you see. But no, bro, just a kid, just like me, you know, now. Uh, but it was really interesting. She said, I never thought about the fact that that's how I started learning. Somebody taught me. In other words, at what point in your life do you start to, quote unquote, to use the language of the poem, bother to take care of the younger? Notice at 3A, I'm back to my observation about Psalm of Life. Third graders are looking at you to know how to act. Are you showing them how to act? Do you bother with them? Has the thought occurred to you that a harsh word spoken to a third grader you do not know could change her day, could change her week? Saying something to a, strange, a stranger who's a kid can somehow have an entirely different perspective on the kid's life. At what point do you kind of start to realize that? You know, Dad in this poem had tremendous power. He still has tremendous power. Right? All right, so there you go. Finish up with your annotations. We'll take a little break. Come back to do a little writing.